Amen. Glory to God. Welcome to the program. Welcome to the Truck Drivers Hour. Pastor Clark Covington here with a great episode of the Truck Drivers Hour. I'm excited to share this with you here today. We are looking at encouraging news uh, from an 11 year old literally being involved in the design of a playground, an actual playground uh, at a park, um, to the idea of courage and surrender, the idea of having faith and believing in God and surrendering to God and how that takes courage. But once we're able to do that and get to that point, we see God's blessings like we've never seen them before. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll get started here uh, with this story about this young lady uh, at designing a playground. So welcome to the program and stay tuned. Amen. Okay, so I read about this uh, during my uh, job, during one of... Uh, I've got a few jobs um, to pay the bills, amen, and one of them uh, was um, uh, was involved at that time, uh, and I'm saying that because I don't know if I'll be doing that later on, but uh, at that time, it was involved with uh, playground safety and things like that, and I read this story, and I thought it was just great to share because it focuses on a young lady, 11-year-old girl, uh, that uh, helps to get a playground designed so her little siblings could play on it. So she's thinking of others. Um, the Bible speaks to this idea of childlike faith, you know, that innocence. I love this story. So from Design Taxi News, and this is, there. there's multiple news outlets that did this story, but the title is 11-year-old girl's crayon drawing gets immortalized as a real playground at her local park. How cool is that? And if you look this story up, you'll be able to see the picture of the crayon drawing. Very cool stuff. Uh, when 11-year-old from Clearfield, Utah picked up her crayons, she had more than art in mind. She had a vision. Uh, Rosalie Olson wanted a safer place for her younger sisters to play at the park just down the street. So she sketched out her ideal playground and presented it to the city's Parks and Recreation Department. Her thoughtful design, complete with a twisting slide, rock wall, rope climb, made such an impression that city officials decided to turn her drawing into reality. The new play area, now called Bicentennial Park, reflects the heart and creativity that Rosalie poured into her original sketch. Construction began earlier this year, with Rosalie reviewing mock-ups along the way to ensure the playground matched her design. From the right equipment to the perfect color palette, her input was central to bringing the project to life. Eric Howe, lead of the Parks and Recreation Department, noted that Rosalie's timing was perfect. The park was already budgeted, but we didn't have any specifics. Howe told the Standard Examiner, once the committee saw the effort she poured into her drawings, it made sense to honor her ideas. The playground officially opened on September 24, 2024, with Rosalie, now 12, attending the ribbon-cutting ceremony, beaming with pride. She told attendees, it's even better than I imagined. It's so beautiful. The new playground has quickly become a neighborhood favorite, giving children a fun, safe place to explore. Clearfield's officials shared their enthusiasm on social media, highlighting Rosalie's dedication to the project. She reviewed multiple versions until we had checked all her boxes and got the colors right. And so that's Clearfield City. That's in Utah. And again, if you go to uh, online, you're online, you go to Clearfi Clearfield City um, Instagram account. So their Instagram name is Clearfield City. You can see a picture, uh, like a slideshow, of the actual playground and the design, and this young lady who's now 12, but she was 11 when she designed it. So cool, just so cool to see this. And again, you know, there was so much about this that I love um, with this story, that, you know, the imagination and creativity of kids, um, the belief that they actually presented this to the city and said, hey, I did a drawing, you know, like, can you imagine the parent of an 11 year old saying, yeah, let's go down to the city and show them what you drew. 
And so I love the family aspect here that they're just caring for the child and giving the child uh, the opportunity to present the design and then for the city leaders to hear the child and actually adhere to this design very closely in the sense of how actually she drew they made you know she wanted this twisty slide it's got the twisty slide she wanted this color they got this color uh, all so that there would be more accessibility uh, for the playground and that's a big trend in playgrounds over the last couple of years is in uh, inclusiveness accessibility People with disabilities, whether they be physical, uh, whether they be uh, cerebral, you know, whether it's autism, whether it's a physical uh, ailment, whether it's uh, any kind of sensitivity, it's allowing all kids to play. It's a big deal in that world. And you saw this, just all of these kind of story notes highlighted here. And I love that good news because in a world where, uh, look, you know, our kids love to go to the playground and we have to sit there. And I mean this, we have to watch them. You know, in the old days, you could be at home and they could be at the playground and you're fine. They could ride their bike home. Nowadays, no, we literally watch them, right? Sadly, that's the world we live in. And so in that world that we live in, it's great to read a story about this. And again, to see the pictures and everything come to life. And it just shows, you know, in the midst of all of these um, challenging, you know, stories we hear about or times that we live in or things that are going on, uh, the Lord is still blessing, and he's still uh, showing us and teaching us things through young kids. Hi, this is Jenny Rose, and I'm eight years old, and you're listening to the Truck Driver's Hour. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to go over a concept or principle here that is very critical to the Christian faith, and that is faith. Amen. In fact, you cannot understand Christianity properly without understanding the role that faith plays in Christianity. And if you're someone from the outside looking in, I saw a documentary and I, you know, only God knows the heart, but I think this person would even tell you they were a lost person. They were documenting the American South and the popularity of Christianity in the American South, but also the decline of Christianity in America and, you know, again, you could just tell they were an unbeliever uh, in the sense that, like, literally they were commenting, maybe it's not a bad thing that Christianity declines. So, again, no one knows but God who's saved. But I think it's safe to say this individual is an unbeliever. And this documentary that I saw yesterday, um, it was short, you know, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes. It wasn't like a two-hour documentary. It focused a lot on facts of history, the Puritans, the early Anglican church, uh, the early Protestant uh, church and how things evolved and what denominations grew and it focused on a lot of historical facts. Okay. But then once it started getting to the revivals, they were described in a very odd way. Um, and it was interesting as it got closer and closer to what we would know as Christianity, uh, the, the, the narrator of this program or the producer really struggled to mention or identify uh, the aspect of faith in the Christian life. They were busy talking about the history and the kind of landmarks and moments, whether it's, you know, from the old times to, you know, Billy Graham and again, revivals to the modern day church, to the mega church, to different denominations. Uh, they were They were talking in, as if Christianity was something you do. Like if you were to be a baker, you would bake bread. Or if you were to be a stock trader, you would trade stocks. And Christianity would be you'd go to church, right? So it's just this idea of religion. But actually, Christianity uh, is really at its core about faith. Faith in who? In Jesus Christ. Specifically, having faith that Jesus Christ died for our sins on the cross at Calvary. And so when we believe Christ being perfect and sinless, came to earth, lived 33 and a half years, perfect and sinless, born of a virgin, fully God, fully man, goes to the cross at Calvary, sheds his precious blood. This is the idea of the atonement or the substitutionary death. The idea that Jesus didn't need to go to the cross for any other reason than to save sinners like me and like you. So the idea is we have to come to terms that we're all sinners. We all fall short. Amen. And then come to terms with the idea that we need a savior and that savior is Jesus. And this all may sound very elementary to you, but many still fight against this issue. 
They fight against the depravity of man. They fight against the idea of sin in the world. They fight against the idea of needing a savior. Amen. I, I can think of an individual who told me, I don't need to go to the altar. Well, he didn't tell me, okay? Someone told me, so it was hearsay, but we'll, we'll go ahead and say it, it was likely he said it. And he said it earnestly. He said, I don't need to go to the altar. I haven't done anything wrong. Which, by the way, it's good to go to the altar even if you have nothing to repent for. But what he was saying is generally he wouldn't repent because he didn't believe he had a sin nature, right? And so the deeper issue is he was at least being candid about it. A lot of people kind of cover that up. They don't want to be candid about it. A scientist once said he doesn't want to believe in God because if he believed in God, then he'd have to repent for all the wickedness that he had done. So it's easier for him to just ignore who God is. With God's hard to ignore, amen. As Jesus told uh, Saul, who had become Paul on the road to Damascus, it's not easy kicking up against the pricks, amen. God makes this life so that we must really encounter him, whether through nature, whether through the church, whether through evangelism, somehow we're encountering God. He is presenting a witness to all, I believe, so that they could all come to this, the, to, to uh, accepting Christ as Savior, come to repentance, and the Bible verse here that, that goes so lockstep with this idea is Hebrews eleven six, New Testament verse, Hebrews 11, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. It is impossible to please God without faith. And we understand that faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. So that's the idea that we can grow our faith by studying God's word. We understand God truly is being matter of fact here, that in order to please him, we must have faith. And if we don't have faith, we cannot please him. And so faith is not just, um, again, like trading stocks and you need to take your series nine test or baking and you need to make sure that you're good with the health department. Uh, it's not, that's not faith, right? It's not just jumping through a hoop. And so when an unbeliever looks at quote religion and the Christian religion, if you will, they're looking at it from a standpoint of what practices do you do? When do you go? What do you do there? It's like, again, it is a very earthly, carnal, worldly, fleshly way to look at it. But God is saying, no, true faith, true Christianity, because Christ, to be a Christian means to be Christ-like. To be Christ-like means to be obedient. It means to have a belief in Jesus, right? Just what did Jesus do? He said, I came to do the will of the Father. Everything I do is not my will, but his will. Lord, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, let thine will be done, right? And so what Jesus modeled for us throughout his earthly ministry, even though he was called to the Jews, right? To establish the kingdom with the Jews. And we, for the most part, being Gentiles here, right? In case anybody that's Jewish is listening, that might be a little bit of a uh, difference there. But if not, then we're all Gentiles. So we're no longer, we're not, we weren't the, uh, the, the group or audience that Jesus was addressing in his earthly ministry. That's something to keep in mind. And I love the words of Jesus as much as anybody, but Paul is our apostle. He is the apostle to the Gentiles. And so Jesus he was calling them to believe, right? And they wouldn't believe, but he modeled belief through obedience. The Bible says he was obedient unto death, the death of the cross. And so he modeled belief for us because Jesus wasn't just an everyday person. He's fully God and fully man. He's fully man. He felt the pains and sorrows that man feels. He went through all the hardships that man felt. He was poor. He was from a know-nothing town. He was of no good report, the Bible says. He was, uh, Isaiah 53 speaks, he had no comeliness to him. There was, he didn't look like a movie star. There was nothing about him that was great and lavish, amen, on the outside at least. But he's perfect on the inside. His heart was perfect before God. He was obedient to God and he believed God. He believed God so much that in the garden there, he sweat out blood drops. He was so vexed by having to drink the bitter cup of sin for all humanity, past, present, and future, so that we could be saved. So yes, he died the most brutal death ever that any human has ever died. His, the Bible says his visage, his face was unrecognizable. He was absolutely murdered in the worst way. A beard plucked out, whipped, you know, the, the, the Bible says anyone that was hung on a tree is cursed. It was the most cursed death that you could have. But that wasn't the hardest part, friend. The hardest part 
was drinking that bitter cup of sin, taking upon the sin of humanity from all past, present, and future. And this is that part there when you read in the New Testament and the Gospels that, that Jesus says, my Lord, my Lord, why, why hast thou forsaken me? Right? That part where, Jesus, where God himself, being holy, had to turn away from Jesus as Jesus took upon himself the sin of all the world because God cannot stand sin. And so for that time, for, the, for that, that, those, those hours, Jesus was without God. And that was the first and only time in all of eternity that he was without God because he had to bear that sin for all humanity. He had to bear my sin, your sin, Hitler's sin, every other person's sin. You know, the most depraved, wicked person, he bore their sin. He bore every sin of all humanity on the cross at Calvary for you and for me. So that when we accept him as Savior, when we believe, when we simply believe, we're born again. We're new creatures in Christ. And that's what Isaiah 53 speaks to, this idea that he suffered so that we could be healed. By his stripes, we are healed. And so poetically, God had ordained it that one would suffer, being God himself, the second part of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, so that you or and I, everyone, could be saved and not have to suffer. So Jesus tasted death, so we don't have to taste death. Amen? Because when we die, whether it's through the rapture or whether we have an earthly death, we are then immediately with the Lord, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord, the scripture tells us. And I believe it is immediate. So we are with the Lord. Once we die, we're with him for an eternity. Matter of fact, we're with him now through the Holy Spirit once we accept Christ as Savior. And you only need to believe. You don't have to have a degree. You don't need money. You don't need uh, anything else other than faith. So we're saved by faith alone, through grace alone, in Jesus Christ alone. And when we understand this principle, our whole lives can change. Because once we're born again through Christ, once we have faith in Christ, what's impossible for us? We are now new. The Bible speaks that we have liberty. You know, we're free in Christ. We're no longer under that bondage of sin. Amen. We are now free in Christ. We have a resting place in heaven. Our names are written down in the Lamb's book of life, never to be blotted out, never to be erased. We have a a mansion there prepared for us in heaven. Amen. We have all of these beautiful, sweet promises that are throughout Scripture. They're now ours because we are now children of God. Before we were a creation of God, but once we're born again, now we're a child of God. And all of this comes by faith. And so the question here I have for you today is once you have faith in Christ, what else can you have faith in? Could you not have faith in his word and what his word calls you to do in what's possible When you submit to the Lord, when you're obedient to God, as Christ was, as your example, when you live for the Lord, amen, when you follow what Paul so eloquently writes about in his epistles, the the, the principles of Christian living, that we are to separate from the world, that we are to live for the Lord, that we are to take up our cross and all of the rest, when we live for Christ— And when we believe that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, nothing's impossible. And the whole world becomes incredibly beautiful at what God can do with us and through us. So we're going to get to this idea of courage and surrender right now. So stay tuned. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you for tuning in today. Today we are looking at courage in surrendering to God. You know, those two words often aren't associated with one another. Courage and surrender. Courage and fear. Courage and giving up. You know, these things don't really go hand in hand. I mean, you think of someone courageous, they're going into the battle and they're doing everything despite being afraid to bring victory and so forth. And yet we here today are looking at the mystery that God has presented before us, this idea that we should have courage in surrendering to him. Because what does it mean to fully live for God? Does it not mean to fully surrender to God? That is a proposition most people could consider or would consider, and I believe I can say this on the authority of God, that the Lord tells us clearly there's a small remnant that will find him and know him 
Of course, he finds us, but that will accept his free gift of salvation. I'll put it that way. This small group is very small because it is so hard to surrender. To surrender is not something that is easy to do. To surrender to God takes great courage because you are saying, I'm no longer the captain of the ship. You are God, and I don't know where you're going to go, but I will trust you. I'll believe in you. I'll have faith in you. And to relinquish control of something as precious as our own lives, as the way that we live, as the way that we go about our day, our life, our worldview, is very challenging. It's something that, again, most when considering it, won't do it. And yet we're called to surrender. And let me give you some scripture here because think of it this way. I want to break it down so simple here today. We're called Christians, and Christian means Christ-like. So Christ is our example when it comes to total surrender. And let's see how Christ surrendered. Look in Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you, which also, which, excuse me, which was also in Christ Jesus. This is the mind that Christ Jesus had. It says here, Paul says in Philippians 2, verse 6, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient, there's that word obedient, unto death, even the death of the cross. So Christ being God surrendered. You know, he made himself of no reputation. Uh, My youngest son asked me the other day, what does God look like? And uh, we said, well, Father God's a spirit, can't see him. The Holy Spirit, you can't see him. But Jesus, there was a time when you could see him on earth. And the Bible does address what he looked like. He was of no reputation, no good report. He looked very average. He didn't come looking uh, like some kind of prince. My wife said like Ken from Barbie and Ken. I was okay, it's a good example. So he surrendered to be of no reputation. Him being, the scripture says, uh, in the form of God, he thought of not robbery to be equal with God. Again, he is God, and he comes of no reputation, and he comes to be a servant. He was and is the King of kings and Lord of lords, and yet here on earth he was a servant. What did he do in his earthly ministry? No one would dispute. He healed and, and, and performed miracles and served others. He wasn't enriching himself. He didn't build himself the kingdom that was rightfully his. Uh, not in the not in the sense that uh, he he did it with uh, building blocks and building temples. He may have done it through his um, beautiful uh, message and so forth that his forthcoming kingdom would be there. Uh, but he wasn't accepted. He wasn't accepted. He was mocked and ridiculed, and he just kept on uh, serving God and being obedient. To be in the likeness of man, he, it was a step down from being God. That's for sure. And this is obedience. This is surrender to humble himself, to rein himself in, uh, the idea of a bridle, the idea of becoming as one smaller than who he really is, or uh, in in this case was. This is what Jesus Christ surrendered as he came to earth, to go to the cross at Calvary, to save sinners like you and me, the idea of surrendering all the way to death. He was obedient unto death. And so when he went to the cross at Calvary, what was he doing there? Well, he was going to that cross. If he's falsely accused, why would he even stand for that? He has all power, amen? He could have called legions of angels down if he wanted to, but he, he allowed the false accusations to persist. He allowed the mock trial to go on. He allowed, the, the, he allowed himself to bear that cross with the help of Simon the Cyrene. He allowed himself to be nailed to the cross. He allowed all of it. You know, the, if you want to get real specific, the Bible says that everything is made by him, and without him nothing is made. This is Jesus. And so he made the cross that he hung on. He made the soldier that, uh, that crucified him, or the soldiers that crucified him. He made them. He allowed all this to happen. Why? Not for his own sin, but for ours. And so to pay our sin debt, he allowed himself He surrendered himself as a willing sacrifice. That's Jesus Christ, amen. So anybody that's saying you can live like you want to or live like the world and still be a Christian or Christ-like is feeding you some kind of false doctrine, some kind of false 
gospel. This idea that it's that, that the Bible's one big just oh we're gonna get some help from it and we're gonna you know figure out how we can hack life and live life better and be rich. That's all junk. Amen. Christ surrendered himself to the will of God. You know, the Bible says that it pleased God that the Lord was bruised for our iniquities, for our sin. Amen. So if we are to live like this, to submit to the Lord's will, we need courage. You know, it's a hard way to live, to walk as God calls us to walk and be obedient in his ways. And let me say this, because I truly believe the Christian life is the best life. I believe that with all my heart that God's principles are true, that as we live as God calls us to live, we are fruitful, we have a peace that surpasses all understanding, we have a purpose, we have that discerning eye that only the Holy Spirit can give us. We understand the way things are that nobody else really could if you're not a Christian, because you see things from a godly perspective as you get saved and you get into God's word and you spend time in prayer and everything becomes clearer in life. So the best way to live as a Christian, but the reason why I say it's so hard is because you have to give up what you want to do. You have to give up who you think you are. You have to give up what the world says you are and what the world wants you to do. You have to give up going down that path that the world has put you on. You see, and that is a, 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 a challenge for anybody. And it's hard because you need courage to surrender. You need, you need bravery to surrender. You need to be like, okay, I trust God so much that even though I'm afraid of how this might work out, I'm going to give it all to him. Amen. I'm going to give it all to him. We love to be in control of things. We love to have routines. I believe we love to have uh, some kind of schedule and know where we're going to be and when we're going to be there. We love to have all the details, amen? And here God's saying, trust me with the little things, trust me with the big things, and I may not give you all the details, and I'm certainly not going to give you a a minute-by-minute itinerary. You're just going to have to trust me. That takes courage. But here in Philippians 4, just a few chapters later from the verse I just read, we have verse 13. says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And so I think it's appropriate to apply this verse to this idea of having courage to surrender to God, because we see that Christ was fully surrendered to to God the Father, amen, being the Son. He's modeled it for us, that we need to do it, we need to live like this as God wants us to live, and that we can do all things, how? Through Christ, which strengthens you, me, strengthens us. We can do all things through Christ, including surrender. And God, he, like I said, he's the one that saves us, amen. He's the one that redeems us. He's the one that reconciles us to himself so that we have peace with God. And now we need to surrender to him. And the idea of, of courage, I want to define it here. The definition I found, there's a few definitions of courage, but I thought this one was a good one. The quality of mind or spirit that enables a person to face difficulty, danger, pain, so on, without fear. And so the idea is uh, being brave or bravery, the quality of mind or spirit that enables, again, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. So our quality of mind by the working of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, and we get saved, we accept him as Savior, we're no longer at odds with God, where we have peace with God, through that person Christ, through who is also God, amen, if that makes sense, we are enabled to face difficulty, danger, pain without fear. And that's what courage is. And that is exactly what we need when we surrender to God. Because again, we don't have to be afraid. I think the idea is that um, it's scary to relinquish control and fear creeps in and then we get anxious, right? And what God, I believe, is telling us here today Uh, through his word, amen, is that you don't have to be anxious or fearful because I will put the right spirit in you to give you the ability to surrender if if you'll simply believe. And like so many messages that I preach, this comes down to belief. If you truly believe God is who he says he is, then you're going to hand over the keys to the kingdom and say, Lord, you're you're driving. Lord, you're not co-pilot, you're the pilot. And I'm over here in the back seat, you know, I'm over here in the third row. If you want to say that, well, I'm way back here doing whatever you want me to do because you are King and you are Lord and you are my savior. And because of these things, 
I'm no longer under the law, so uh, that's not, not an issue. The law has been fulfilled by Christ, and uh, I'm no longer going to hell, amen, because I've been saved, and now I can do as you want me to do, and I'm your son or your daughter, so therefore, you're not going to leave me or forsake me. I'm not going to be you know, left out, because honestly, that's where that fear would come from, is that we would somehow be forsaken by the Lord or put in the situation that we couldn't bear. But God won't do that. I don't believe God will do that. God will test us. He'll put us through the fire, but he'll do it in a way that he knows that we can bear it because he is living within us. And I want to touch on one more idea of him living within us, and we'll get to the idea of courage a little bit. You know, we always talk about how, okay, I can do this because God's living within me. Well, what about God living within you, understanding all those fears and anxieties you have, all those emotions that you have, if he's living within you, is that not communicated to him? I believe it is. So before you even can pray to God, say, Lord, I'm a little worried about this. He already knows. I believe the Lord can feel that pain, that agony. And this is just the preacher talking here, but I believe the Lord bears it with you. I believe Christ is so close to the, to the saved, to the truly redeemed, that he actually will bear that with you. So that as you go through those trials and as you go through those pains and you and you, and you struggle and you strive with God to, 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 to relinquish control and you're like, this is so hard and I, I want to just go do things my way and it's so difficult. When you go through that, I believe the Lord is right there with you, bearing those burdens and seeing those pains and comforting you through the work of the Holy Spirit. So courage, the idea of courage. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. I love this verse. And it, you might, my life verse, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, about not following your own instincts, trust God. But this one is right up there with it. 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So we know God's sovereign. So he's the one that's going to give us the spirit. He's the one that's in full control. And the spirit that we get, we're saved. It's not a spirit of fear. What is it? It's a a spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. I can't think of three better characteristics that I'd like to have in the spirit living within me if I'm going to be surrendering than power, love, and a sound mind, okay? Because power, that sounds really good, okay? Power is like, yeah, you're in, you know, God's in control and he has power, amen? Power over the enemy, power over this, the, the things of this world, power over the obstacles of your life. God has power over those things. And of love, that is what brought Christ to the cross, love. And that is, he, God is love, amen. You can't know love if you, if you don't know God, amen. God is love. Not just love, but that idea of agape love, which is a sacrificial love. So he's given us the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind, like a sober mind, a reasonable mind. God's not asking you to go on a roller coaster that's going 5,000 feet in the air and hope that you can hold on for dear life. God's says, look, you have a sound mind within you. He's given you that spirit of a sound mind of reasonableness. Uh, The Bible word might be moderation or temperance. Amen. The idea that look like we're okay. You know, uh, there's been times when, you know, I'm chomping at the bit to do something. The Lord will just have me just sit down and maybe just watch a video or read a, you know, a article on my phone or something and just calm down because we're okay. And this spirit of a sound mind means that we're not like on the extreme, even when it's living for him, because he is a God of detail and like logic and, you know, building on a pathway and stuff. God's not just uh, temperamental or just like pulling a string. Boom. You know, you're going to go do something, you know, God is building something and setting something up so we can have trust in that spirit living within us that we have a sound mind, power, love, and a sound mind. That's what we want as we tackle the courage of surrendering to God. The idea of being without the fear, the idea of overcoming our fears is difficult. You know, I think that the most challenging part is, uh, you know, I have a unique perspective. I got saved in my, in my twenties and I was in the world for a while. And then I got right with God right around 30, 31, 32 in that region there. So I can look at both sides of it being in the world. I didn't have these anxieties that I have being a saved born again, Christian 
And I think that's because now I'm on the winning side, amen. And now I'm in, engaged in spiritual battles and I'm working in the ministry full time. And there's all kinds of snares and problems and how many people deal with those in the ministry. I mean, the, the, the missionaries, you get emails from them, letters from them, and you read all the stuff they have to go through. You think that's a coincidence? And you have people that maybe don't have to go through any of that stuff that might be in the same country just doing secular work, you know, and you say, hmm, that's interesting. It is a spiritual battle. And so the devil will attack our, our minds as best he can. Amen. I don't think the devil could possess our minds, but I, have, I believe he can throw anxieties our way. I believe there's things he can do. Right now I'm preaching and the air conditioning just went out. Air conditioning worked fine for, um, I think, two years now, a year or two now. And it went out today while I started preaching. Hmm. Again, you know, so the Lord, you know, we're in this battle, we're dealing with obstacles and God wants us to not have fear. And that can be difficult because again, as we surrender to God, the devil knows that devil's not a fool. He knows we're surrendering to God. It's okay. I'm going to attack their anxieties. I'm going to attack their feelings of, of being out of control, of, of not having, uh, uh, whatever they think they need, et cetera, you know, enough sleep, enough money, enough, uh, whatever medicine, you know, whatever it is, right? Here's the thing, this God-given spirit, he is sovereign. So if we trust his word, we can trust him and his promise. We can trust that he will deliver us from the enemy. We can trust, get this, that he'll use the enemy's attacks against the enemy, amen? And just like how I was able to say, oh yeah, we lost the air conditioning and that, and that deals with you know the spiritual battle you're in or whatever it is. See, it made it into the message to help communicate this, this battle we're in and God's like, there you go. See, something that looks like a fiery dart ends up being something to score a point for Jesus Christ. Amen. God seeks us out. God saves us. God works out in our lives who we are to be. So we shouldn't be afraid of this process. The idea of courage is simply to trust that God is the one that will see us through. Put it on his big shoulders and he can and will do it. The idea of courage is saying, God, I trust you enough that I will surrender. And that is courageous because most people won't. Amen. How many times, I don't know, only God knows, how many times has God called someone to do something? Let's say they're in a corporate office and God's calling them to go full-time in the ministry. Um, let's say in the music ministry, right? And they're dragging their feet and they're dragging their feet and they're dragging their feet. Why? Because they're scared to surrender to God. You know, how are they going to feed their family? And what about the insurance? And what about this? What about that? Legitimate fears. But God is saying, just trust me. If you'll just trust me, I will make a way. And is God not big enough to make a way? I love in the scriptures. I absolutely love this. I think it's mostly in the Old Testament. You know, when God's like talking first person through one of the prophets and he's like, is my hand shortened? Is my arm shortened? Is anything too difficult for me? I'm reminding you, I am God. Amen. You know, I love, absolutely love reading that. I love being reminded of God's great power, his great power. I was witnessing to someone once and I told him if God wanted to, he could take a lion and put it in our kitchen right now. If God wanted to, he could take a bear and put it in the bedroom. If God wanted to, he can take this house and flip it upside down and make it into an ice cream parlor. God can do whatever he wants to do, right? I don't know if I gave those exact examples, okay, just to be clear. But the point I was making is God is real. He's all powerful and he's sovereign. He can do what he wants. And so is it too hard for God to help you to trust him? No. Does he know your anxieties? Yes. Therefore, it takes faith. This is not something unique to you or to me or to whoever. Look at Deuteronomy 31, 6 in the Old Testament here. Be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee. See, the Israelites were afraid. They were so afraid of the Canaanites because they had giants in the land and everything. They didn't want to go and conquer the land of milk and honey, the promised land. They didn't have belief. Spies are sent over there. They come back and most of the spies say, oh, no, we couldn't take them out. Caleb and Joshua says, no, we can. And by we, we mean God. But you see how the Israelites were, 
They were contextualizing their battle to their own strengths and weaknesses. And God's here saying, I, I, hold on a second. You just be strong and of good courage. Fear not. Don't be afraid of them. For the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee. You see, we try to put the battles on our lap, in our hands, and God's saying, no, put it in my hands, put it in my lap, see what I can do with it. Again, what is too hard for God? You know, what can man do to one of God's elect? You know, if God has determined that he will give the land to the Israelites, he's going to give it to them. He got so specific and said, look, I'm going to wipe them out in a certain kind of way, amen, that the grass doesn't get too overgrown, <laughs> you know, that the cattle are still doing fine. I mean, it, God had everything planned out, you know, and, and how does God do it? He could do it with the sword. He can do it with the angel. He can do it with the hornet. I got a hornet's nest in my shed for my work. I get stuff for work from the shed every day. Most days roll up that garage door and boom, all these hornets come flying out <laughs> and I duck and run. And my wife and I were trying to come up with a strategy. I think there's some way we can wipe them out, but these hornets, you know, they're, they don't play around. And there's scripture that God sent the hornet and wiped out this whole group of people. God is able in any way he so chooses to destroy the enemy, to secure the place for the believer. And what was going on then, that doubt and that unbelief that was going on in the wilderness. And by the way, that whole generation that doubted God, they were all, uh, they all died off in the wilderness before they could go over to the promised land. The children of, of that generation could go over the promised land besides Joshua and Caleb. The same thing that was going on then, that unbelief, is going on today. People will sit there and reckon and say, you know what? I'm just going to hope that, you know, God's benign. God doesn't care. God just is up there just minding, you know, whatever. And the Bible's not true. I'm just going to hope these things and live how I want to live. Because if I'm living this way that God's calling me to live, I, I, whew, I wouldn't have any control. I wouldn't be able to do what I want to do. Do you see? And so what is the answer? Is it thy will be done, Lord, or Lord, my will be done, right? And we see in our example of what Christ did. He was obedient unto death. And he even says later on, I'm going to get to the scripture, hey, Lord, let your will be done. Even though he didn't want it to be done, he still was courageous enough. And that is that type of courage we need to embody. So spoke on courage. And now let's look at this idea of surrendering to God. Proverbs 23, 26. My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. You know, we don't know what's best for our own good, but God does. And the flesh doesn't want us to relinquish this power of control. You know, I love how in Proverbs 23, 26, it says, my son, give me thine heart. You know, our ministry is called Heartland Ministry. We talk about how Romans, uh, I think it's 10, 9, uh, 10, 9 through 13, the idea of believing, confessing with our mouth and believing in our heart. Amen. The heart is like that deepest part of us. And God is saying, give me your heart. This idea of surrender is give God your heart and observe his ways. Surrender cannot work if you say you're giving God your heart and you completely ignore his ways. You completely ignore his word. You completely ignore what he would want you to do. That's called willful ignorance. That's the idea of saying, oh, I didn't know God. And God's like, we had plenty of opportunities to know. Amen. You know, we don't know what's best for our own good, but God does. And that deepest part of us, that heart, we are to give to God. And it's so hard. And maybe it's hard to give our heart to God because of fear of getting hurt, fear of rejection, fear of failure. Yet if we have faith, we must do this. We cannot be afraid of these things. We have to have that courage to give the Lord our heart. And what are we to do? Where do we get our example from? Look to Christ. He was surely fearful of Calvary, yet he obeyed God and surrendered even to death. Surrender isn't so much an action on our part as an inaction. It's simply being still, going along with God's plan. Amen? And you say, well, could God himself be afraid? I mean, I, I think, again, people don't understand fully the context of what Calvary was about. It wasn't the plucking of the beard and the mocking and the ridiculing that fulfilled prophecy. And that was hideous and horrible. The fact that he was beaten so hard that they couldn't recognize him. 
It was the most brutal physical death man ever suffered. But that is not what I believe was vexing the Lord so much. It was taking on this sin, drinking that bitter cup of sin for all humanity. Remember, he's sinless and perfect. So if he's going to the cross, he has to take the sin on of all mankind. And drinking from that cup, can you imagine? I can't even imagine bearing my own sin. You know, I can't imagine bearing my sin plus one other sin. I couldn't imagine bearing four people's sin or a or, or, or a, a ten people's sin. I can't imagine bearing a criminal's sin. I can't imagine bearing a heinous criminal's sin. And yet Jesus Christ bore the sin for all humanity, past, present, and future. He carried that on his shoulders. He drank of that bitter cup, which nobody would ever want to do. And in human form, I believe, and God helped me to say it correctly, that he didn't want it done. You could say fear, anxious, whatever it was. I mean, he was sweating drops of blood. He was per- vexed and perplexed. And, you know, he was let down. I mean, think about how traumatic him knowing, Christ knowing what he was going to have to go through. Again, not just the physical, but the spiritual aspect of literally being murdered on that cross, tortured and murdered and bearing all that sin, being in the ground three days buried, and being raised again, that, that's beyond comprehension. And he's looking around, the disciples are falling asleep on him, you know, and he's like, these, you guys are supposed to be, you know, my, con- my confidants, my allies, my friends, the ones that are, you're going to help me here. And I'm being betrayed by one and the rest of y'all can't even stay awake, you know, God help us, God help us to surrender as Christ surrendered, to be obedient as Christ was obedient, to understand what being a Christian truly is. It's not about um, just saying, oh God, you're great. Now let me live my own way. It's about true surrender. Psalm 46, seven through 11. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Come behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear asunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. We are to be still. He is the one that will make the war to cease, to break the bow, to cut the spear, to burn the chariot. He is the one that will be exalted. And we simply need to be still and obedient. And that can be really, really hard. You don't hear people, you don't hear it said, oh, so-and-so, they're being still before God. You hear it, they're running from God, right? If they are not doing what God said, it's always some kind of action. They're running from God or they're backslid, amen, or they're out of church, right? It's never, oh, they're just being still before God. No, that's the part that's hard. That's the part that's hard, amen. We are to surrender with courage. And why does it take courage? Here we have this scripture I've alluded to, Matthew 26, 39. And he went a little further, this is Jesus, and he fell on his face and he prayed saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. So Matthew 26, 39 is addressing what what I've spoken about just a little bit ago. He wants the cup to pass from him. What is the cup that would pass from him? That cup of sin for all mankind, past, present, and future, that he had to drink from, that he had to consume, that he had to bear on the cross at Calvary so that all could be saved that believed on him. That's the cup he wanted to pass from him. Jesus is asking Father God, you think Father God's going to hear the son's prayer? I think so. Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let the cup pass from me. I would be praying, begging God, if I were in that position, Lord, whatever you do, get it, please. But Jesus says in his godly maturity, in his beautiful, sacrificial love, in his absolute, incredible courage, Jesus Christ says in Matthew 26, 39, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. That should be our attitude, amen. That should be our calling card before God. God, if you're not going to take this away, whatever the burden is, not my will, but yours. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. I surrender to you. I'm not going to try to get out of it. I will live this life until you call me home. That's it. Jesus suffered. 
The man in him not wanting to die and drink that bitter cup of sin, but ask God to have his will done. That is how we are to live. We must do the same thing. Obedience is simply following God wherever he takes us. Despite our emotions, our will, our opinions and experiences and so on. We simply have to trust God. There have been times lately, friends, that I have wondered what on earth God is. I keep telling my wife she thinks I'm a broken record. I keep saying, who can know the mind of God? Who can know the mind of God? Who can know the mind of God? That's scripture, and that's where I've been at lately because things have been happening. Not just to me personally, though. A lot has happened personally here. Uh, This summer has been challenging, if I'm being honest with you, in so many ways. But to others that I care about, love, and and know and hear about uh, things happening that um, surprised me and grieved me and on and on. And it's just, God, what's going on? God, what are you up to? But, you know, honestly, that, that might be the flesh in me because the spirit in me should say, nevertheless, thy will not mine. You are king. You are Lord. You have a plan. Let your will be done. Now, if this were easy, how would we show God our true belief? Right? So God, he already know, looks upon the heart. He already knows. He's perfect. He can see past, present, future. He made us. He's the engineer, the designer, the creator, the author. He knows, okay, who believes and who doesn't. I believe that. He knows everything. But he gives us free will, number one. And again, I mean, you know, I could have just said, I'm not going to preach this, right? It's like he didn't make me preach it. Amen. He gives us free will. And secondly, he allows us to show out our beliefs. In, in, in exercises like this, where we surrender to God, right? This separates the believers and the non-believers, right? This separates the believers and the non-believers. And, and I'm going to read some scripture here and we'll wrap up. And this is the idea of separating the sheep from the goats. Matthew 25, 31 through 46. So just a little further down in Matthew from the scripture I just read. Matthew 25, 31 through 46. Let's see what it says here. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. So remember we started this message talking about how God, Jesus Christ, came of no good report, of humble and meek and lowly and all. And now we have something different here. The Son of Man's coming in his glory with all his holy angels with him. He's going to sit upon that throne of his glory. He'll be on that throne, amen. This is Jesus resurrected. This is Jesus Messiah in, in the resurrected form, amen. And before him shall be gathered all nations. I take that as everybody. And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. You always want to be on the right if you can with God. Amen. Then shall the king say unto unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For For I was a hungered, and ye gave me meat. And I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. And I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Now you see this mystery here? That the righteous don't even know that they were ministering to Jesus when they were doing these works that are good. And I believe some churches may just kind of not rightly divide this and say, okay, well, if we do these works, that's our invitation to heaven. They, they need to get into Paul's epistles and realize we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone. The whole idea of justification by faith, not justification by good works. But when we're saved, we get the Holy Spirit, we're surrendered to God. Guess what we're going to be doing? Good works, Right. I don't know about you. I mean, it's been on my mind heavy. We went to Charlotte today to the city and uh, not like the downtown, but, you know, a little outer part of the city. I don't want to name the specific area to put that down, but it's an outer part of Charlotte and there's so much homelessness and it's sad. You see families and you see people literally just sleeping on the side of the street. 
it's like a hundred degrees out and they're laying there under a tree or, I mean, we were at a restaurant, like a, like, a, um, uh, uh, you know, you order at the counter and, and, and you get your food and sit down fast casual. That's what they call that fast casual. Okay. We're at a fast casual place. And my wife said, look over there and there's a lady just laying on there on the ground, just outside on the patio, just, and my wife said she was up a minute ago and it breaks my heart. And we are to minister to them, not because of what we would do out of the flesh, but because what Christ within us is having us do because we're surrendered to him. And so many people look at this passage of scripture and say, I need to do some good works. Well, I doesn't get you anywhere. Good works will come as you surrender to Christ. That's just a byproduct of surrendering to the Lord, living for him. You get in his word every day. You pray every day. You're fully surrendered to God. You'll be doing good works. You'll be doing more good works than you can imagine. And conversely here, we have verse 41. This is for the goats. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay, so hell is real. Okay, Jesus Christ is saying everlasting fire. That's not like some kind of, you know, alluding to something else. That is everlasting fire. Okay, then shall he say unto them on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. And who is hell prepared for? Prepared for the devil and his angels. It's not prepared for man. Man's going there simply because of their unbelief. This is for the devil and his angels, the fallen angels. Verse 42, for I was a hungered, you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in, naked, and you clothed me not, sick and in prison, and you visited me not. Okay, now th- just think for a minute, and along the same line of thinking here. If we're not capable of when we should know to do good, right, we're also probably not capable to know when we're doing bad and we shouldn't, right? Think about that, you know? People ask, why are Christians so charitable? Maybe it's not them and their personality or intellect. It's God within them. And you see it playing out here. Verse 44, then shall they also answer him saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered or a thirst or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them saying, verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Now, again, it's an interesting scripture to kind of close out with. But as we surrender to God, the point I'm making is there are eternal consequences because we have this courage to accept Christ and live for him. And those consequences are vast. And I believe it deals with how we live out our lives and what we do for the Lord and where we end up. I mean, I believe we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone. So someone that truly believes in Christ they're justified by faith. That's it. Amen. And at the same time, if they're justified, justified by faith, they're going to be living as God wants us to live. And that is going to result in eternal blessings. So a super simple way to wrap it up. We are not able to do God's will without total surrender. I think I've covered that. Jeremiah 10, 23. I love this verse. Oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. That's so true. Amen. Our ways are so far from God's ways. We don't know what we're doing. God tells us in his word that his ways are higher than our ways. We don't know what we're doing. We need God. It's not in us to know our ways. How can we need God and then not surrender to him? Right? How can we need God and say, okay, I only want 5% of you, God, even though I fully need you because you made me. I just want that 5%. I just want to kind of like narrowly get my way into the gates of heaven and I'm going to live like the world. That's ludicrous. We need him. The way, the way of man, the way we're supposed to live is not in us. And he, I believe, expects us to surrender to him completely. And this takes courage. We must realize God has given us the spirit of a sound mind of love and power and not fear. And when we have courage to truly pray and seek the Lord's will in our lives and live for him no matter what the calling is, we will then be able to live as God has called us to live. And we will then see firsthand his promise not to leave us or forsake us. We will see his blessings like never before. We'll have a sweet fellowship with the Lord that very few have today. Total surrender takes courage, but total surrender with courage leads to a relationship with God that is very powerful 
and I believe the true way that he'd have us to live. Consider that, pray on that, give your heart, your mind, your soul to God, give it all to God, surrender to him, give him the keys to the car, give him everything. Don't hold anything back. Don't keep any one little compartment within you saying, well, everything but this little pet sin or this little thing, give it all to him and watch as he changed your life and as he guides you in the way that he'd have you to live. And that is the best way to live. Thank you for listening. Take care. God bless. Amen. From our family to yours, thank you for listening to the Truck Drivers Owl.